Okay, very good. Okay, so the meeting is going to be recorded now and it's uh, started. So by continuing to be in this meeting, you're all consenting to be recorded. Okay, very good. So let's get started. And once again, I'll start with, you know, and now once this also should be, um, you know, pretty clear to you all. I uh, don't want to go through this again, especially if you've been, you know, being part of these sessions. So this is our fourth session. So first of all, welcome you all. Um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on the time zone you are. Um, this is um, our module three Zoom session today. Um, some adequates that you're already familiar with, um, you know, especially the video, uh, muting a microphone if you're not talking. These are our two big ones, right? The, the data we can be flexible with. So if you have questions in between, you know, feel free to, you know, unmute your microphone and speak up. Uh, absolutely no issues. Um, you could also put in your questions or comments in the chat room and Yelena may be following that and, you know, helping me with that. And I'll also try to uh, keep up with it as much as possible while I'm presenting. Uh, today's session, um, it may go over a bit in the sense, uh, may, and I say over, not about, um, you know, and a half hours, but maybe a little more than an hour, I'm guessing. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I'll try to kind of keep it to an hour max if possible, okay? But just be prepared in a few minutes extra here and there. Okay, so with that, um, let me go on to our next slide here. And I hope you all are able to see my screen very clearly. Um, so today's agenda, we'll talk about data visualization. I know you've been, you know, have been going through a lot of material this week. And um, so this, this session going to today is going to be just kind of reviewing some of the material that you may have read or and something that is going to be important. So kind of supplementing uh, some of that as well. Okay, so just to make sure that you're prepared to take on assignment three and, and also kind of make sure that, you know, by the end of this module, um, you've kind of got the key lessons learned, right? Um, then we'll talk about assignment three, very important. Um, just want to kind of go over uh, what the ask is to ensure that everybody would be doing you know, all the necessary um, you know, things that are required. And then you know, take on any questions that you may have, okay? So as I was saying, today's session is, is going to be a little different. We, we're going to start especially. Um, so this session is going to have a couple of videos uh, that I'll be showing you, very short videos, so don't worry. Um, don't want to bore you at all, and I hope you like the videos along with me. Uh, but in, uh, before that, I want to make sure that your speakers are okay, you're able to hear this. So the first video, I'm going to start here. Um, tell me if you're able to hear it, A. B, make sure that your speakers and everything's okay. So I'm going to run this video for, you know, maybe 20 to 25 seconds or so, um, just to make sure that you're able to get your, your setup ready at your end, okay? So with that, I'm going to start this video here. Everybody able to hear the music? Can one of you please yes. confirm? Yes, I can hear it. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think I gave you time to check your setup, and I believe you are also able to hear it through um, the session here, through the Zoom session as well. So I'm going to now start the first video that I want to show it to you. And this is a very short video. Again, it's three to four minutes long. Um, and hope you enjoy it, okay? So here we start. So I realized that's what marketing people are good at. They can take statistics and make them say whatever they want. They can make their message fit a statistic. So I figured if they could do it, I'm an engineer, I'm a prototype guy, so I worked up some slides to prove that anybody can do that, if we can go back to my slides. So here you go. I looked at some statistics and I found these on the internet and I'm just gonna make it say what I choose to make it say. So they, they pulled a thousand people. Turns out three out of a thousand people polled said they've choked on a potato chip. Not died, just <clears throat> and they were fine. 
Same thousand people, only one in a thousand said they've choked on a pretzel. So if you were in marketing, you could say, pretzels, the snack that's three times safer than the potato chip. Okay. Absolutely true statement. Suddenly people would be running from that dangerous potato chip. Kids are killed by them every day, run! Another quick example, your chances of getting Alzheimer by age 85 are one in 10. Kind of scary, actually. The average smoker lives to be age 66. So if you were in marketing at a cigarette company, you could say, smoking lowers your chance of getting Alzheimer's. Right? Absolutely correct statement. I can see the commercials now. Go ahead, light up, you won't be getting Alzheimer's. We hope to stamp it out in the next generation. Go ahead, two a day. Now you may ask, why does this matter? And here's why it matters. People get scared all the time. They don't realize that five or 10 times a really small number is still a very small number and not very likely, but they freak out. My mom is the best at this. She always hears these things and she's afraid to use anything. Cause she's, and I worked up this example to prove to her that it's irrational to be scared and it ended up scaring her anyway. So here you go. One out of 1,677,345 people will get mauled by a bear. Really not very likely. Could be a bear right there, probably not gonna maul me. They're, really, statistically, it would just keep walking by. Even if you're a bear, only one out of 335,469 bears are involved in the mauling of a human. But it turns out two out of 10 people have never seen a bear. Therefore, if you've seen a bear, you're 10 times more likely to get mauled by one. My mom's conclusion, don't look at bears. It's reasonable. I never went to the zoo till I was 26 years old. But then again, I've never been attacked by a bear either. Maybe mom was smarter than I give her credit for. Okay. All right. So that's the end of the first video. Now I'm going to go on to the second video. So hold on, this is going to be a little longer than the first one. Uh, ho hopefully you'll enjoy this as well. Okay, here we go. Uh, I put my act on PowerPoint several years ago. <laughs> and the reason I did this, I, I, didn't, I don't usually admit this straight up front of my show, but I was an engineer for many years. And I realized in the age of information, we have all this information and no engineer has really tackled relationships because the answers are out there. We just need to find them by good engineering analysis. So I have done that. I put it together and I'm now gonna offer the first chapter of my user's guide to relationships. And I thought I'd start with a positive one. Everybody's talked about the key to relationships. I believe this is the key. Oh, by the way, your results may vary. I believe this is the key to a good relationship, a long relationship. Your spouse's looks and your vision need to deteriorate at exactly the same rate. If that can manage to happen, I can always look at my wife and go, you're as beautiful as the day I met you. Now let's look into some of the more challenging parts of relationships. I knew my wife was a great arguer, but unlike a lot of guys, I took the time to analyze why I was losing so many arguments. So I plotted the chances of winning an argument versus time. And it turned out the three distinct periods popped up. When we were first dating, I had a 50-50 shot in any relationship. I had no idea that is the best I would ever do. Those are glory days for a man right there. Those are Hall of Fame numbers, one out of two. Because once I got engaged, it immediately dropped to one and four. And then since I've been married, I am 0 for 963. I actually thought I won once. We argued about who won the argument. I lost the argument who won the argument. So I won once, but I'm not allowed to say it. <laughs> so I actually did, this is a true story. My wife and I were having an argument. I decided to flow chart it to see where I was going wrong. Okay? It was a simple enough argument. I was hanging my son's mobile of all the planets and I was hanging them all up and I got to Pluto and I went to hang Pluto and my wife went, you know, what do you do? And I go, I'm not going to hang Pluto. She goes, what are you talking about? I go, well, Pluto's not a planet. It was, yeah, it was declassified. It's like an astral object now. It's not, she goes, yes, it is. That's where the argument started. Watch where it goes. 
so she says Pluto is a planet. I say, no, it's not. She says, are you saying I'm dumb? <laughs> that is what we call a trap. Because if I say yes, that leads to divorce. So of course I say no. She says, well, I don't like the way you argue. Pulling out science and facts, making me feel dumb. You are saying I'm dumb. Again, if I say yes, that leads to divorce. So I say no, and she says, well, you don't respect me. You don't care about my feelings. This is a trap in the other direction. Because I say, no, I don't. That leads to divorce. So I say, yes, of course I care about. And she says, well, do you want to have sex again? Well, that isn't an option. So in my uh, house, Pluto is officially a planet. In fact, it is my favorite planet. <laughs> and I changed the mobile. All the other planets revolve around Pluto now. <laughs> so this, I promise, will be the nerdiest thing I present to you. They're in computer design is what I used to do. There's a thing called Boolean logic. It basically says if there's two inputs, A and B, and both are true, the output's true. A and B have to be true. If either one is false, the output's false. It's really boring. It gets funny, I promise. <laughs> There's an OR gate says A or B is true, the output's true, and only when both are false, the output's false. Here's how I figured it out. The key, if you're not married, take out your phone, take a photo of this sex chart. This is the key <laughs> to a happy marriage. This is a man and a woman. Two inputs, man and a woman. If the man is right, is wrong, and the woman is right, I started an easy one, that's an easy one. If the man's wrong, woman's right, the woman's right, right? Makes perfect sense, that was easy. If you're both right, doesn't matter, woman's still right. <laughs> If I'm right and my wife is wrong, which happens every now and then, doesn't matter, woman's still right. <laughs> and if we're both wrong, uh, the man is wrong. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll take a couple moments to get your phones. <laughs> now, a lot of times I'm, when I get in trouble, I'm trying to help. I was watching my wife vacuum one day. My wife's name's Laura. And clearly, uh, she had no uh, vacuuming plan when she began her vacuum. <laughs> she would go that way for a while and that way, and it was horribly, horribly inefficient. <laughs> and I decided I could help her out. I said, you know, honey, I was watching you vacuum, and you could save some time if you just thought about it. If you went around the room like a Zamboni, right? <laughs> at an ice rink, if you got smaller and smaller, you could finish in like half the time and do just as good a job. I'm trying to help you, it's, it's, it's more efficient. She said, you know what, Don? That is helpful, it is more efficient. Wanna know why? Because you're gonna be doing it from now on. <laughs> Our ongoing argument I call the thermostat wars. <laughs> My wife, like a lot of women, was born with no internal heating capability whatsoever. <laughs> She's constantly cold. It could be 100,000 degrees, I'm a little cold. Let's put another blanket on. No, I haven't crossed my legs in 14 years. I like it somewhere between 60 and 70 degrees. She likes it somewhere near the temperature of the sun. It's ridiculous. Our cat has shaved. That's how hot it is in our house. And then finally, I'll end on this. I love my wife, but I can't stand the shop of my wife. And I couldn't prove to her why. She thought, well, she took it personally, like, you don't like being with me. No, I just can't stand it. It's not the way I shop. And I couldn't prove to her how different it was. It's like I got a GPS tracking device, and I tracked our shopping trip separately. Here's how I shop. All you have to do in this experiment is go to the mall, right? Here's the mall. Go to the Gap, buy a pair of pants. That's all we both had to do. Here's how I do it. I walk in the mall, take a left, take a right, buy the pants, take a left, take a right, and go home. That's it. That takes me six minutes and costs me $33. That's it. I am done for 2013. Here's how my wife shops, same thing. Gotta go to the Gap, she walks in the mall, there she is right there. <laughs> Three hours, 26 minutes, $876. And look, she never even got to the Gap. <laughs> now the stunning thing about this is she's seen this, I've been doing this bit for like three years. She came back to me with an answer, I swear to you. She goes, you're looking at that mall thing all wrong. Let's like see who is the more efficient shopper in terms of cost per minute. You, Mr. Smarty Pants, spent $33 in six minutes. That's a cost per minute of $5.50 per minute. I spent $876 in 206 minutes, a cost per minute of $4. I kicked your ass, mister. <laughs> and that's when I knew my wife was the woman for me. Thanks. Okay, pretty cool. All right. Okay, so like a quick analysis here, guys. Okay, so 
first of all, just with a yes or no, did you enjoy these videos? Can I get a few answers, please? Okay, Corinne says yes. Yes, okay, okay. I see lots of yeses in the chat. And by the way, guys, you can unmute and speak up also, okay? It's up to you, but all right. So thank you for that. Um, now, what was so different about Don McMillan's shows than the other comedy shows? At least a one-liner from a few of you. That's what I'm looking for. What was so different? Anything that comes to your mind? PowerPoint, okay. Thanks, Mary. Anyone else? Anything different than what just Mary mentioned? I like the breakdown of the logic. That was funny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yep. I but agree. he even brought it into the conversation. It was pretty. It was pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. I, I agree. Okay. Thanks, Amanda. All right. Okay. So with that, what do you think? Why do you think that I showed the first video on statistics, right? Didn't we cover data preparation in module two? Then why this video now? Why do you think I showed you this video? Uh, a lot of his punchlines, the guy that these, uh, the way these jokes were set up, uh, it was uh, supposed to kind of be about reframing the problem. I noticed that pattern throughout. So maybe is that why? Okay, well, okay. And any, any, any other different answer than Chase? You have to, there's a responsibility in presenting um, data and statistics um, to, um, that's kind of an accurate representation of the intent. You both are right, absolutely. Yeah, the way the problem is framed and, and B is how, what Amanda just mentioned, right? Is how you present it. You could scare the hell out of people if you are not presenting as much as the statistics, the visualizations are also important. If your visualization is not up to the mark and you are showing something different than what it should really show, you're going to scare people away. You're going to really, you know, completely, um, what do you call the, the data that you're showing would be turned completely different, okay? So that's what I wanted to say that as much as statistics, I think even visualization, you have a big responsibility on how you display it. All right, so with that, why do you think I showed the second video on husband and wife relationship? <laughs> there were too many, by the way, this was a little longer, but I hope you guys enjoyed it, you know? So is this session about watching Don's comedy sessions? What do you guys think? What was the second video about? Oh, I'm, I'm, when I was talking about, when, when I was with you, know, like there was a lot of problem reframing for lack of a better term. I, I meant it for both videos. I, I didn't realize, but so yeah. Right, right. okay. Uh, no, no, fair, fair enough, yeah. fair. I, I think yeah, that's that's a good observation, Chase, no doubt mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, how the the, 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 the the he frames the problem, how the punchlines and all of that, of course, he is, is a comedian. So, you know, that's yeah. that's the key. That's the, the main thing, right? That's, um, that's the biggest talent they need to have, uh, the punchlines. Mm -hmm and how they kind of present their punchlines and when the timing of it. Yeah. But what I, I, I think the, one of the, the big because reasons for showing the second video was that you may probably not remember all of what he said. What you may remember though, are all those visuals and charts that he put it up. He's one of the very few comedians who uses PowerPoint slides. And the way he, he draws those pictures, the charts, the way he puts it up, it sticks into your head, right? Just this little table that he put up there, some visual of uh, how he shops or how his wife shops and all that, that would probably stay with you for a long, long time. You would not have to remember all his jokes because if you have the, you know, you'd probably remember the visuals and remember some of the jokes that he mentioned, right? So once again, that's how powerful data visualization is, right? It can stick to your head very easily. So anyway, but there are you know many good shows. If you really liked it, if you're not seen before, um, please, you know, you can see there are lots of them on YouTube, okay? All right, so with that, um, 
So there's a little affirmation, you know, just uh, some pearls of wisdom, I would say, some words of wisdom from a couple of, you know, very popular, very smart people. Um, the first one is, you know, from Charles Migledi, is a, he's one of the data visualization expert. And um, his quote was, you know, data visualization is the art of depicting data in a fun and creative way beyond the possibilities of Excel tables. In a way, it's like setting figures to music. I completely agree with that, right? It's, it's, it's an art. As much as you think it's a science, it it's definitely is an art on how and what you would display. And, and here's the second one from another very popular person um, that I'm sure you all would know and remember, um, Steve Jobs, who said, design is not what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. And you may wonder, what is this in reference to? Maybe his reference could have been iPhones, but it reference it refers to data visualization if you think about it also, right? It's not just how beautiful picture you put it up there. That picture may better be right, right? <laughs> Otherwise, if it doesn't work, if it is not right, it is not going to be you know, beautiful in any way, right? Okay, so, um, and, and just because these two people came up with these beautiful quotes and attested how important data visualization is, let's not just take their words, maybe just look at some of the statistics, the real statistics, right? Like the first one here, it takes only 30 milliseconds for the human brain to process an image. The human brain processes image, images 60,000 times faster than text. 80% of people remember what they see compared to 10% what they hear and 20% of what they read. 90% of the information processed by the brain is visual. And lastly, social media posts that include images produce 650% higher engagement than text only posts, right? Very, very powerful stats. And I'm sure it, the last one may resonate with you all, right? The, maybe the earlier, the first few bullets, the three or four bullets, we may not have a proof for that as such, but it, you may still agree with that. But the last one, maybe you would have, you know, some of you maybe are on social media and have been, you know, posting on social media and you know how important posting an image is, right? A picture is, which leads to more engagement, more clicks, right? That's how powerful data visualization is. So, but once again, just because it is important and it doesn't mean if there are certain rules that we all need to follow without which, once again, you know, it could fall flat and, you know, you may, be, you may be just putting up something that's very obscure or you could just skew the data or the information that, that is presented, right? If it is not done correctly. So some of the, the rules here, you know, first of all, for how you want to do the storytelling, because it's all about storytelling, right? And how you tell the story. You just saw Don's videos and the way he presented his story, it was not just about visualization. It was not just about how he framed it or this punchlines, but also the way he told his, each of his stories so quickly and, and, and perfectly with some visualization, right? So what are the, some of the, the rules here, though? some of the rules of thumb? First and foremost, you know, pictures are worth more than a thousand words. And yeah, you may have read this before multiple times and you may all agree with, with this, but let's take an example. Let's, let's say if we have a data and a story to tell, let's look at how we would put this in a sentence, how we would just you know, look at the data points, just emphasize on the data points, and then, you know, just see how a visual would look like and what, if, what happens when a visual is, is placed, okay? So let's say it's about the luxury brands, right? And, and which brand has the, the maximum followers on Twitter? So here's the sentence. You know, among, among the luxury brands, Chanel has 13 million Twitter followers. Burberry, Dion, and Louis Vuitton have 8 million. Gucci has 6 million, 
and both Dolce and Gabbana and Versace have 5 million, right? Simple sentences or a simple sentence here that kind of just tells you about the luxury brands and their Twitter followers. Now let's put it in the, emphasize the data here. So here's the breakdown of the brand following on Twitter, right? In million, 13, against it, you have Chanel, eight, against that, you have all the other three companies that, uh, and the brands, six, against that, you have Gucci, and against five, you have the other two brands, right? Dolce Gabbana and Versace, right? So this is how you'd put it in, 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 a, in a, like emphasize the data points. Now let's look at this visual here. Just by using this visual, you know, it's, it's something that will stick to your head very quickly, very easily. At the same time, you added also some more data points and something that you would also be able to retain it in memory for the longest time, right? So again, a simple use of bar chart with the picture of the Twitter bird goes a long way. So once again, that's why they say that, yes, you, we just saw how we took a sentence, emphasized the data, put it in the visual, which one is more effective? And I'm sure you would all agree with me, this last picture here is, is more and effective than all others, right? The, the other two ways. Now, let's look at the, the other rule here is, it's not just about putting a picture, but choosing the right picture. That's important, right? So. Now let's say there are different message types, right? You have, you know, you want to compare different data series. You want to probably look at the distribution of data series. You want to look at the breakup of a whole, like in you know, a composition of a data series, or you want to just have relationship between data series, right? You want to just look at the relationship between the two or a trend or trends of data series, right? So let's say these are the different things that you want to present a portray and and what are and for each of these different ways what kind of a visualization can you use so for a comparison which is to compare one data value with others you could use a column chart could use a bar chart could use a line chart and a scatter chart right and i'm sure you must have all read about this um, and and know that you already used it as well and I'm sure you're going to be using it a little more in your assignment. But you know, this is one of the simplest charts and yet very powerful when it comes to comparison of data series. Next for the distribution, which is to show the spread of data values over categorical or continuous values, you use histogram, you use the box plot, right? We talked about the box plot last time. We just went over what are the different points on a box plot. Then you have the kernel density estimate plot, which is showing you the, the probability density function, right? It just shows you the density here of the data series and then it plots it. So, so you could say, and for an example, like you know, distribution of bugs found in 10 weeks of software testing, maybe you could use one of these plots to you know, demonstrate or, or present that. Now, if it is, you know, breakup of a whole, right? If you want to kind of, you know, have the composition of, of, the, of the whole uh, or a particular data series, you could then make use of a pie chart or a donor chart. And, and I, I know we kind of also gone through this in the discussion, right? Um, when it comes to pie chart or donor chart, once again, just a word of caution, and, and this is just me, but I'm sure it's, uh, couple of you had also mentioned about it that you need to be very careful with pie charts, right? Don't get too much carried away. It's one of the simplest charts. It gets used a lot. It's more popular because of the ease with which you can draw it uh, with any data series. But if there are more than two or three um, you know, uh, parts, you know, it, it becomes very convoluted. This does not, is not an effective chart if there are more than two or three parts of the data series that you're going to be, because, because you lose out on what's the proportion. Let's, let's look at the, I mean, both the pie chart and the donor chart here. We have like almost five parts that are being displayed and we don't know exactly the proportion. Yeah, we may guess it. And maybe there's, 
you know, a thing, um, there's, there's a label to each of those parts, but then once again, it may not do a good job with, you know, presenting the proportion. Maybe you could then in that case, use a stack column chart or a stack bar chart, which if you see visually, it kind of clearly indicates the levels within the data series, which could be very easily and more comparable. Okay, so once again, but these are the different charts. I mean, it's definitely available. I'm not saying never use a pie chart or donut chart. It does have, um, you know, a place um, in, in visualization. And at times it has really worked well, as I said, like if it is two or three parts that you'd want to show that, you know, it becomes very effective. For example, gender, right? If you just want to show, you know, the genders, um, you know, within, your, within all the employees within a company, or, you know, maybe that if you had just two or three categories of employees within your company, maybe, maybe it's, it's useful that time, right? Next, you know, for relationship, to show the relationship between two variables, you would use a scatter plot or a line chart. A scatter plot, if it is one data series as comprising of X and Y, scatter plot becomes, and it, the scatter plot is an easy chart. But if you want to compare, you want to go beyond the scatter plot, right? You have more than one data series that you want to chart as well as compare and, and, and see, look at the relationship this way, then a line chart becomes, you know, uh, an important chart in that case. In that case, you want to use that one. Okay. Next for the trends. Now to sh show the trends over time, you know, you could once again use the line chart and you see this all the time, right? If you're, you know, if you're working with stocks and you're looking at the stock market, you're looking at the, how the stocks have been doing over time, a line chart, as you would see, this is one of the most popular charts that is being used, right? Most common chart that is used. The next common chart for time series is the area chart. Now it may look like a density plot or a density chart, but it really is not. It's, it's just the plotting of the line chart and it's kind of, you know, you know the area is, is kind of colored for all each of the data series. That's what the area chart is. And then you have the column chart, right? The stack column chart or just a column chart where you can see the different trends. At the same time, you may be also able to see the relationship as well if you want to, okay? So, it's kind of all put together. There's another picture here that is also shown. Um, it's, uh, it was on a different website that I kind of liked it, which is, you know, put it all together here, the relationship, you know, which charts to use for distribution, um, for composition, for comparison. I think one of the charts that, you know, was in addition here was the, the bubble chart. Um, and that's on the relationship, right? On the first one there, you see this bubble plot. And I, I believe one of you did, um, one of your classmates did put up or, or discussed about the bubble chart. Um, you know, maybe the size of the bubbles or just, you know, displaying the data series in a bubbles form, um, which again, you know, could, could uh, you know, is, is a good chart to, you know, for uh, displaying relationship. Then for comparison, you've seen table, you've seen a spider chart, right? What, what Nightingale used for her chart, very close to a spider chart, right? Um, and, and this is for showing multiple items and then comparing multiple items. That's when you would use a spider chart, right? But once again, it's, it's another, you know, um, besides what we just went through, this is another chart here that you could use for, you know, picking up which, which chart would you use? And sometimes you really don't have to think much, but just there are certain rules and you know, certain charts that you can use for uh, what, you, what, what message you want to present. Next, aesthetics, right? It, that cannot be ignored, whether it's size um, or colors um, and anything of that sort, like any kind of aesthetics um, is, is very important. Let's take an example here, right? Let's say you want to put up a picture of a traffic light, right? And, and this is a, the, the most common traffic light across you know, many of the countries. And um, so if you put up the, the, the picture of a traffic light like this, what do you think is a problem here? What's not right with this 
traffic light picture. Anyone? The colors. The color, absolutely, right? If you're going to be putting up a traffic light in most of the countries, I know in Japan, you go, you could say that you have a blue color, which is, I get it, but in most of the countries, it would be red, yellow, and, and green, right? So in that case, you would probably have to have the right colors because otherwise you're not putting up the right picture. 3D, once again, people get carried away with, with 3D. And I have seen a lot of charts where 3D could be used, but what of caution again, it can lead to occlusion, which is on the left, which means that, you know, you could see that one of like, if you have multiple data series that you want to display, you could see how it hides one data series with the other. And you could think, oh, maybe yellow is important. That is why it is on, it's in front. Maybe blue is not important. Blue data series is not important. That's why it's back. But really that may not be the case, right? Once again, it's, it's, it obscures the view here. And maybe these are all in different X, Y, and Z planes. Um, they are different, you know, they're using a complete uh, different X, Y, and Z planes or coordinates, which is again, not comparing apples to apples. It can also lead to distortion where you try to put up this donor chart in, in a 3D form. And what has happened here? It's once again, not very clear what the proportion is. The front layer could be, or the front part could be a little different than what you see in the background, right? The, the proportion could be just completely different and it's not easy to, you know, pick what, what the proportion is here. So be careful with the 3Ds. I, I think, you know, 3Ds are good for pictures for, you know, when you want to show the depth and, and you really need a third dimension. But if your chart does not need a third dimension, then it's better to avoid it. Now look at this picture here, okay? It's, it's a pie chart with the, the revenue of three, different companies. What do you think is wrong with this chart picture here? Anyone? Any guesses? It appears like the center isn't correct or maybe the colors are wrong. Okay, well, oh, oh, let me give away. So pie charts are good for, you know, parts of the whole, right? It's not a good chart for depicting or presenting three different cities. It's in three different companies you're trying to present. And what, what's the point here, right? If, if you're going to be comparing the revenues of three different companies, then you would put up like a pie, uh, like a bar chart or a column chart, which would do, uh, you know, which would make more sense. But when you're using a pie chart, the the underlying um, theme is, or the idea is that you're going to be showing the composition or the parts of a whole, that part of one data series, and not showing three distinct or three unique data series being put into one single chart. Okay. Now look at this one here. Why do you think the one on the left, they put a red cross there and the on the right, there's a green, a green mark there. Take a look at this, spend a few seconds. Because you have the percentages labeled on the right. Well, yes. That's the scale, yeah, the scale, absolutely. And you both are right, the, both the percentages, the first of all, on the left, you start, you, if you look at the axis, it starts at 50 and on the Y axis starts at 50 and goes all the way up to 65. And then you're putting all those three different groups. So you see the level that you see for group A, B and C. And then on the right, you're using the, the axis go starts from right, uh, I'm sorry, from zero, and then you're comparing the groups here. You can even put the numbers. I mean, it doesn't have to be percentages, but what I'm saying is you look at 
left and the right picture, it's the same series being put into different axes. So once again, the axis is also important. So which axis you choose to show your visualization, okay? Next here, what do you think is wrong with this chart? What is happening here? Comparing two unlike things or things that are not in the same category. Yeah, I yeah, mean, absolutely. Unless it's a really You're comparing weird category. Something weird. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right, Amanda and Mary. The, um, the ice cream sales, you're comparing with violent crime. So if I have to look at this chart, it says, it would mean every time the crime rises, my ice cream sales goes up. So if I'm an ice cream vendor, I better, my day should start with thinking, hey, I hope there's a lot of crime in this area so I get more sales. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, and, and I think, what what uh, the reason they are both so close because of the weather maybe the the weather between may through october is is it's a warmer months where the crime could basically go up and so does the ice cream sales because of weather but look at how they're put up together here which does not make sense okay so be careful with what you put it up here for comparison Next rule, cluttering. Absolutely recipe for disaster. And if you don't believe me, look at this chart here. <laughs> you, you've, you have, <clears throat> once again, I'm not saying the data behind it is wrong, but the way it is presented here, it's going to take you a few minutes to even understand what, what this chart is, what is this chart really presenting, right? How is it presenting? What are those boxes for under each bar? Um, and what do they mean? Like it's, it's almost like a tree map um, being depicted as bars. And each of those multiple tree maps are being put together um, on an X and Y axis. So it's again, very, very difficult to decipher, very difficult to um, you know, see what it is, but because of there's a lot of information here that is put up here. And, and maybe you can still keep up with this chart if it is kind of divided into multiple charts. Maybe you take two or three or you know four countries at a time. Maybe it would get a little better than what this is. But once again, just showing that it's, it's definitely recipe for disaster. Never put this kind of a chart on your present during a presentation because you are going to spend minutes <laughs> and minutes and minutes to really explain that chart to your, to your audience. Same thing like, you know, if you kind of add 3D and you try to clutter it with a lot of information, you know, it just defeats the purpose of clarity as it's put up here. It, it just crowds the visualization, it obscures meaning, and it may lead to inaccurate conclusions. Absolutely right. It's going to be very difficult to conclude what it is trying to present. So once again, just some, some few things um, that regarding cluttering here, you want to limit the number of KPIs, the key performance indicators in a dashboard to nine or less so that it's easy to focus on and easy to understand what the dashboard is about. Keep the visualization simple. The less there is to interpret, the easier it is to understand. We just looked at a chart, a couple of charts actually, um, where you saw that, yes, it will be easier to understand if it is limited and it's kept simple. And if your visual looks cluttered, try a different format. The cleanest format is usually the best. It's not that the complex chart is usually the best. No, the complex chart is always going to lead you into more problems, especially if you're going to be you know, presenting to an audience and then explaining to the audience. Um, people are not going to say, oh, maybe you're the smartest person because you've got the most complex chart up there, but people are going to be lost and confused, you know, and, and maybe, you know, your presentation is, 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 um, and is going to be in big trouble, right? You're going to spend a lot of time explaining that. So the next rule here, interactive charts are the next big thing, right? And we all know, and 
I think many of the tools that are available today that you will see, and you'll also learn about in future, and, and do some coding with R and Python, you would see that you know you would be able to present charts that are going to be a little interactive. Like this one here, very simple. It, it is showing the, the baby boomers, how they're moving from you know, 1955 all the way up to 2055 or 2060, right? And what you see on the y-axis is, is their age range, the range of ages. And what you see on the, you know, on the x-axis is the percentages that are, um, you know, that you could see the percentages of, um, you know, the, of the baby boomers that's kind of rising and what's the proportion, okay? The next chart here, once again, not to really go into interpretation, but just showing you how very simply you can, and this is done in Python. This one, this particular chart is done in Python and very easily you're putting up a scatter plot there and underneath is, is a bar chart. And every time you zoom into this picture or you highlight a portion of this picture, your, your chart at the bottom, the bar charts are, the bar chart is really changing accordingly. Beautiful, right? Very powerful, especially when you're explaining to your audience or you're you know, explaining your analysis to your audience, it becomes so powerful. So yeah, interactive charts are becoming more and more popular, but once again, you do not want to go for any complexity, right? Keep it simple still, but um, just one of the ways to do it, okay, and powerfully. And finally, the value of garbage is going to be garbage. <laughs> this is my favorite thing, and I'll, I'll show you why I say that. Look at this chart here. Um, may not be, I hope uh, you're all able to see it on your screen very well, but just spend like a few seconds on this chart. What, what, do you, what do you guys see in this chart here? What, what is it? What is put up here? Can someone volunteer after you spend a few seconds? What's wrong with this chart? Let me put it this way. Maybe that would be an easy answer. It makes no sense because it's sideways. Okay. Okay, Mary, I'll take that. Anyone has a different answer than Mary? Okay, let me give it away. It's kind of hard to tell. Oh, sorry, say uh, again. It's kind of hard to tell too, like for the Americas, like where like where the United States stop and where Nicaragua and Venezuela yeah. aim. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. You guys are right. Um, and, and, and just giving it away, look at the y-axis. Does anyone know? Is there a y-axis here? I don't see a y-axis. I don't know why and how those dots are at a certain height. Even within, I, I understand it's a percentages of people who believe vaccines are safe and for each of the continent and each continent is colored differently. I get that. I get that the continent, the, the countries are going horizontally within that continent. Um, I see that it when it goes horizontally, it is showing me the different percentages for that country. I get that. But then I lose out on why is the at different height? What does that height mean? What does that y-axis mean here at all? No idea. Absolutely no clue. So if I can't really you know, find out what it is, I mean, this could be a lot of effort here put in, a lot of work involved here. But because you've not presented it well, you've not followed the best practices of visualization, this becomes a garbage, right? So, so again, you know, for, for all due respect to you know, whoever do, did this chart, but if it is not presenting it well, it's, it's garbage for me. It's garbage for the audience. So just putting it all together, once again, you know, pictures are worth more than a thousand words. Choosing the right picture is important. Aesthetics cannot be ignored. Cluttering is a recipe for disaster. Interactive charts are the next big thing and the value of garbage is garbage, right? All right, so I'm going to leave you with this last thing here on visualization and then we'll move on to, you know, talking about uh, assignment soon. But 
you know, this is another masterpiece. Uh, you saw one from Nightingale, right? Here, what you're seeing is the Napoleon's march to Russia, his Russian campaign of 1812. And what makes this chart very notable is because of, it's, it's kind of mentioned here, you can just read along with me, but it's, it's notable for its representation in two dimensions of six types of data. The number of troops here, the number of troops is this, the width of this. So this Napoleon is going from left, going from here all the way to Russia, which is right here, Moscow. You see the size of troop is, is the, actually the size of this band here or this line here. And the reason it is moving in it, it, the direction is showing the direction it takes to reach Moscow. And along there are other types of data here. There's distance, there's temperature, there's latitude, there's longitude, there's direction of travel and location relative to specific dates. So this, all this, you know, what you see the cream area here all this area which is colored in cream is the march from here on the left to the right to Moscow. And then this black is when they get defeated and they're all kind of coming back. And as while they're coming back, you see the numbers kind of dwindling down. There was a lot of, lot of losses for this army, for Napoleon's army. A lot of people losses. A lot of people were lost in this battle. And that a lot of people lost in this travel as well because of the brutal winter that catches them while they're coming back. So, but beautiful chart, again, a lot of, um, as I said, six data points that were displayed on a single chart. And this is years ago, once again. So again, another masterpiece that I wanted to just show it to you. And you can read that more if you're kind of interested. I've, I've put in the the, it's in, it's uh, in, in the Wikipedia and I've put in the source there, okay? So what we've gone in the last couple of modules, couple of live sessions is A, you know kind of now how to prepare the data, right? And, and what is involved with data preparation? There could be some integration of data that could involve cleaning of the data, some transformation that may ha happen, some reduction that may happen. And this is what's going to prepare your data to take it to the next step, which is data visualization, which you all saw during this or, or read about in this module, right? And you practice some of it. And you know you kind of learned about different types of visualization that's available in Power BI, okay? So that before I move on to assignment three, any questions or any comments, anything in general? And the slides that we just reviewed. Okay, I'll take the silence as no, and I'll move on to talking about assignment three. How are we doing with the time? Well, okay, well, not too bad. Guys, we won't be going over too much, maybe five more minutes in case, but it depends on the, the questions we get. But okay, so let's quickly go over what's required in assignment three. So, and I got this question also today in the classroom. So in case anyone still has any confusion, there was a good question that was asked in and asked the professor section in the classroom. How many visualizations do you need for assignment three? First of all, there are not just five, there are eight visualizations that are required. So you have to create at least five using industry standard techniques. For these five visualizations, you have been told which visualization to use. It's not just any five, but you've been, uh, you've been given some um, you know, suggestion there or in, in the assignment. The next, you have to create three additionals in uh, using the Q&A feature. And this is where you can pick your own. You don't have any given suggestion for which one to pick, but you can just pick based on what you see from the data, what you ask the data. And so in total, there are going to be eight visualizations. You discuss the impact and purpose of each data visualization, and you do that within the notes section. Remember, we just don't want the slides that you just come and kind of you know, put it up there and leave the notes section blank, because if the notes section is blank, you're not telling me about this visualization, what it is about, right? 
So you're going to lose points on that. So be careful, ensure that you put in the impact and purpose. You build a dashboard. Actually, you're going to build two dashboards to convey the story about the data, okay? And, so, and, that you, and once you're done, you kind of publish your work to Power BI service. You then export your report from Power BI into a PowerPoint and all these instructions are there in the assignment. So you're given step-by-step -step instructions. And then, um, so that you will pr provide a PowerPoint presentation that explains each of the eight visualizations, the two dashboard panels and recommendation. So you should have almost like maybe 12 slides. Like, you know, you have a title slide, you have your eight visualizations, you have a recommendation. I think one more probably what I'm missing on the, the summary. So there are kind of 12 slides that goes in here or maybe more. It depends, I'm just kind of giving you a ballpark depending on what is required here. So if you're sending me two or three slides, maybe that you may have missed out on something, right? And you don't want to crowd your slides with putting in multiple visualizations because then you will need a lot of space to explain that in the notes section. Okay, let me pause. Any questions? Okay, it looks like, is there a way to pin visualizations to a dashboard or do we basically just put the visualization on report page called dashboard and convert it to a dashboard in the Power BI? No, there's, there's like a dashboard. You would, you would call the report page a dashboard. You would click, so you would see the instructions, Mary, within the assignment on how you would create the dashboard page. And then you would copy, basically copy the visualization from your actual report to this dashboard page, which will be like a culmination of multiple visuals into a single page called dashboard. Okay. I hope I answered your question, Mary. Yes. Yeah, just to make sure that I understand. So it's basically just a page called dashboard. It's not like the dashboard, the interactive dashboard that's available in the Power BI service. No, no. So that okay. it, it, it's, it's a page where you will put in all these information in together, correct? Okay, perfect, thank you. But yeah, look at, look at the instructions as well. So, you know, just to make sure that you, you get it. So, you know, let me see if that has been mentioned. Let me just give me a second and see what has been mentioned. Yeah, because in the instructions, it says that it describes how you copy them and paste them and reshape them. Um, but I was just confused by the vocab by the use of the because there is technically something called a dashboard on the on the online Power BI, and that's yeah. different than that. Right, right, right. So okay, perfect. You will create two new pages named Dashboard Panel One and Dashboard Panel Two. And then you will go into each of your eight visualizations that you created, right click on the visualization and select the copy visual. That's it. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, all right. Okay, any other questions? But good question there. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on um, to the rubric. And this is the rubric. Once again, you'll find it in the assignments. I'm not going to go over, but look at this. Every, every page is going to be important. You have a title page. You have the visualization. So title page and visualization is nine slides. Dashboard is two slides. That makes it 11. And then you have the recommendation, which makes it 12. So I'll be really looking for 12 slides in your deck, right? Less than 12, that's going to make me work hard to kind of see what you've missed or what you have you know, tried to put it in and, and squeezed it into you know, one slide, more than one thing, right? Um, so, and, and please, 10 points for taking, right? All you need to do is before you submit your um, a PowerPoint, just run a spell check, right? This is going to give you 10 points. It's not going to be that difficult. 
And it's not something that you need to do. It's just click a button, which does the work for you to ensure that none of you don't have any typos or spelling errors and which will kind of fetch you the 10 points. Okay, and the title page, another five points. So please do not miss out on some of the easy points here that are part of this assignment. Okay. And I do not see any posted question. I did put it up there, but I did not see until you know, a few minutes before this session, I did not see any questions that were posted. So I believe people are good. Everybody's okay with it. Oh yes, there's one, um, there's definitely one thing that I want to clarify. In the assignment description, there is one area when it is talking about the slides, it says six minimum. Um, please, if you are, again, uh, please pay attention here. It's not six minimum, it's eight minimum, okay? If you're also listening to this recording, if you use in the assignment description, it says six minimum. Six minimum doesn't mean six minimum slides for your visualization. It doesn't mean six minimum visualization. That six is actually eight, okay? I hope I do not confuse anyone. Okay, so we went over the analysis. We looked at the, the videos. We went over some analysis on the videos. We talked about data visualization. Uh, we talked about the different rules, you know, the general rules of thumb, basically. Uh, we talked about assignment three um, and then the, the requirements of assignment three and the rubric. And um, there weren't any questions, but there were some impromptu questions here that we talked about. So with that, I just want to leave you with the you know, future references here. This particular book, I love this book, trust me. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. If you get a chance, um, this book actually comes with an exercise book as well, if you want it. But just this book alone um, is, is worth gold, trust me. It's a beautiful book that tells you about, you know, how you want to do the storytelling with data. It talks about all the different charts, how you would use it, all the nuances, um, uh, all the do's and don'ts and all of that. Beautiful book. I would highly, highly recommend it. It's not required for this course, but if you have any bandwidth after this course and you would really want to go a little deeper into your storytelling, which is one of the key skills, of any data scientist, then you may want to read this book, okay? So again, I'm not soliciting it, I'm not the author, and I do not get paid for any book that you, um, you know, would buy from anywhere, okay? But just something that I, I, this is my personal experience of reading this book a couple of years back. And then I also have one of Don McMillan's videos, if you really enjoyed it, there's one more video that you probably you may like, and some of the jokes are repeated, but you know you may probably still want to kind of just go over it. It's called The Greatest Charts, Volume One. Okay, all right. So before we call it a wrap and we end the day, uh, any questions? Okay. Don't see any questions in the chat and no, again, okay. Very good folks. So thank you all. Good luck with assignment three. I will be looking for your submissions pretty soon. I hope you enjoyed the session today. Good night and good day. Thank you. <laughs>